welcome everyone to our panel in migrant on migrant ministries in the Los Angeles region. Our first presenter will be Reverend Lee De Leon, and he is the president and CEO of the Templo Calvario Community Development Corporation. And then we have Hei Pin Im, who is the executive director of Faith and Community Empowerment, which used to be Korean Churches for Community Development. And then we have Reverend Kelvin Sals, who is the co-founder of Black Alliance for Just Immigration and is a network strategist with the Community Health Council, as well as being a local pastor. So thank you so much for joining us. And we are going to turn it over to you, Reverend De Leon. Buddy, thank you, uh, Alexia, for this invitation. And uh, just to kind of keep things on track, I'm going to go ahead and use a PowerPoint. This gives you a, uh, uh, you know, give you a short uh, picture of who we are and what we do. Uh, Templo Calvario, uh, just to give you a little background, is uh, is a community development corporation that was birthed by uh, a church in, in the city of Santa Ana. Um, our church, uh, Templo Calvario, it's Latino. Um, it's uh, been a church highly committed to missionary work, uh, evangelistic work, um, and, you know, long history of compassion. Uh, in uh, 2003, uh, we launched the CDC, and uh, looking at our city, we were very concerned that we were not seeing transformation take place. We had a lot of different programs going. We were working in different neighborhoods. Uh, we had a food bank, um, but uh, things just were not changing. And in 2004, a report came out by the... Um, Rockefeller Center uh, for Government, and uh, uh, they listed uh, Santa Ana as the hardest city to live in in America. And so uh, that clearly pointed out to us that we were on the right track. Um, in 2010, we moved to the present focus, and I'll, I'll jump to that. The, uh, we have we work in three different areas. We work in education, economic development, and you know, what we call faith mobilization. Uh, we have two different projects in um, in the um, in education. We have a charter school, and we we have what we call a parent project. It's a training pro uh, program for for parents. Um, in economic development, we have a program called Banking mm -hmm. on Our Youth. We have another one called Seguro Financial. Uh, and uh, basically we try to, uh, you know, uh, teach financial principles, so it's financial literacy, entrepreneurship. In the area of Seguro Financial, we work uh, primarily with adults in that area, um, but we help people launch their business. We help people buy their first home. Uh, so we do, uh, but we, we move them through a series of, of, uh, of lessons and training. Uh, in the area of faith, because we've been in Orange County and or the evangelical church is very strong in Orange County, and we've had these partnerships uh, for many, many years, um, we decided to try to encourage others to come along and join us in the, in the whole of community development. Um, and so these are churches, and we, we formed what we call the Kingdom Group. We formed churches uh, that not only are from Santa Ana, but from the surrounding cities. Uh, we have events like Love Santa Ana and other events that we host. But beyond that, we encourage them to get involved uh, with schools, uh, just different programs that uh, not only uh, programs that we operate, but programs that others operate in our city. Uh, this is just a quick little uh, picture of our kids, some of, some of our kids. We, the charter school runs about 400. It's a K-5 charter school and, um, and uh, just doing really, really well. Um, it's uh, one of the highest performing schools in our city. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we were at the top 1% in, in math growth. Last year, we were in the top 3% in, in language arts. Uh, so really grateful for the leadership that we have at that school. 
Um, one of the programs that in the area of financial literacy is, uh, as I mentioned, banking on our youth, which we call BOY. And we work with high schoolers in our city, teaching them financial principles, but we also uh, train them in the area of entrepreneurship. So uh, we have youth that register for that, that kind of have that mindset. Um, and uh, just want you to know that almost 100% of the young people you see there in the picture, and this, we have a different group every year. Um, you know, go on to college. We have young people in the, in the major universities across the country. Uh, and, many, and many of them, of course, uh, majoring in business. So this is kind of gives them a kickstart in that area and connects them uh, with some of our fi uh, financial partners in, in the region. Uh, and by the way, the financial partners, uh, a lot of the times uh, hire them uh, as you know, interns, so they work with them during the summer months and that. And then they stay connected. And a lot of those partners are actually their mentors. Um, this is another program that this is one of uh, the ones that we've had probably the longest. It's called the Santa Ana Parent Project. And um, we started this uh, um, oh, about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. And uh, just providing uh, training uh, to parents uh, on on the, on the, what what is called the 40 developmental assets, and uh, so we took those assets, working with focus on the family, and we came up with a, a training program. Uh, in the 10 years, it's become it's become a national program. We didn't take it national; they did, uh, but. Um, it is now being uh, translated into different languages. It is it is uh, a evidence based program. It was it was a third a third party came in and they did testing and and uh, they gave it that that uh, recognition. Um, but I'll come back to that because that's been a, a program that has really impacted our city. Mobilizing faith. I mentioned it earlier. We do a lot of different things in the city. Some of them are large events where we, we gather, you know, just a ton of volunteers. But we also uh, just do the mentoring. We do uh, just different programs with, with other churches and that that join us. Our city, just to give you a picture of, of Santa Ana, and Santa Ana mirrors what a, a lot of cities in Southern California are. We're 77% Latino, 12% Asian, 10% white. 50% of our, of our community is foreign born. Uh, our school is almost 100% Latino and uh, the school qualifies, the entire school qualifies for free and reduced lunch. Um, just, you know, as a, leading this organization and leading this work, sometimes you wonder, <laughs> uh, are we having any kind of impact, you know? Um, is there change taking place? Is there transformation taking place in our city? And I mentioned the school and how the school is doing, um, but also the parent project. You know, it, we it, it was wonderful that a group out of Colorado or you know what was it? Um, yeah, in Colorado that came out and did the testing and and showed that the program was really uh, a great program and it was really bringing change to hearts and lives. Um, Families, uh, the other thing that we've discovered that uh, one thing that brings success is when our families uh, join two or more of our programs. Uh, the parents may be in the parent project, the kids may be in the boy program or one of our other programs. Um, and that, that leads to an incredible success. We've had some tremendous testimonies and stories that are continue to be played out when that happens. The kingdom group, we have 20 to 30 different churches. And I say 20 to 30 because 20 are, uh, are highly engaged in just a number of activities. And then there's a group of other churches that can't get involved in everything. They have a lot going, but they're still uh, participating as mentors in the city and uh, doing other great work. So that's been something that is, for me, it's been uh, exciting to see the church come alive. Um, one one little story um, that uh, that's happening. Going back to 
through the uh, uh, this program, the Parent Project. You know, one of the you know the only reasons that we have reached uh, and impacted our district like we have is because of these these parents. Um, they took the program. They grew the program. What we do, we take parent leaders from all the different schools and we train them on the program. And then we release them to go out and do the teaching themselves. We don't have professionals coming in. We wanna empower them to do the, the program. So now, uh, you know, our district is a large school district. We, we uh, you know, have uh, somewhere near 50 schools. Uh, and we're over in uh, we're in over 40 of the schools, or at least before the pandemic, we were in over 40 of the schools. And uh, so they took, you know, they took the uh, the program and just continued to grow it. Uh, we developed a council, and uh, just to be able to do that and to do it right. And uh, we're really grateful to nine ladies that came out of this group uh, that have. Uh, continue to grow the program. And, and now with the pandemic there, we had to pull out of the schools, of course. Uh, and now they went online and they're doing it online. But just incredible work has taken place. A lot of the ladies um, um, have are now leaders in our community. Uh, they, I think just being a part of, of the parent project um, has, uh, has, you know, shown them that they can truly impact, that they can truly bring change. Uh, so we have uh, two or three of them that have uh, developed neighborhood associations or some type of a collaboration, uh, you know, and they deal with different justice issues in their community. So it is just exciting. Uh, our city uh, has, you know, has applauded our work because they say, you know, uh, out of that group has come so many leaders in the city of Santa Ana. Uh, so for us, that's been uh, just very exciting to see that happen. Because you always wonder, I mean, <laughs> um, are we impacting, are we bringing transformation? So really grateful to these ladies and what they're doing in the city of Santa Ana. Uh, if you know if if some of this you know kind of interests you, this is our my contact information, and uh, or you can reach out to our to our uh, COO. But um, you know, I uh, one other little story about a mom that um, that uh, joined this partic that particular prank program, the Parent Project, and I talked about those that get involved in or two or more activities. Uh, she was just so excited about the change it was bringing to her. And she wanted not just to take the classes, but she also wanted to be a parent leader and give the classes. Uh, she, we found that we were having problems in one or two of the schools. So she decided, hey, I'll go help them and I'll, I'll do some hand-holding and help others. Um, as her kids grew up, uh, her oldest, uh, she made sure she got him into our different programs. And last year we featured that that family. Uh, her name is Maria, and Maria and her family. And uh, and the son wasn't there. He wasn't there at the event. And uh, but he called in. He actually we he zoomed in, and he was in Mark Zuckerberg's room. Uh, he says, "You know what?" I'm calling and I'm sorry I couldn't make it, but I'm in Mark Zuckerberg's room. And he's I, everybody like, what room are you talking about? His house or what? And he was actually calling from uh, the room at Harvard where Mark actually lived, you know, the dorm he lived in. He says, I was pr privileged to, uh, to be able to be in this room. So, but he, you know, he gave the story of his mom and the transformation that happened in their home and how mom, her, his mom became a leader and just, it was very inspirational for him. And now, now he, um, you know, was able to succeed in school and get a full, full ride to Harvard. So, uh, and we have those stories. Um, we have many of those stories. So it's uh, just exciting for us. Thank okay. you so much, Lane. <laughs> 
That was just wonderful. That was so inspiring. It's always so inspiring to hear you. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone. My name is Hay Pinim, and I serve as president of a nonprofit called Faith and Community Empowerment, or FACE. Um, we say we strive to bring the face of God through service and lift those who are faceless. Our former name actually was called Korean Churches for Community Development. And I think one of the things that all immigrants and migrants face is displacement. And so in that way, when you're in a new world, new neighborhood, uh, you are really alone um, and um, left alone without relationships, without a lot of things that we take for granted when we are permanent residents uh, or citizens of a country. And so for us, um, particularly as Korean Americans, Asian Americans, um, there's many times when we feel very much isolated in the sense that uh, we get none of the benefits of being a minority <laughs> and we get none of the benefits of white privilege and it's like a no man's land. Um, and I think for myself, um, again, as a Korean American coming out of the Los Angeles riots, where out of the billion dollars in property damage, over 40% uh, were incurred by Koreans. And when our community was kicked down and crying, um, you know, my question was, why aren't there others to cry with us? And that has always been a question for which um, that has led me on this journey. I want to show, show you uh, for a video of our 15th anniversary. We're actually going on our 20th anniversary uh, this coming March. So mm -hmm. by the grace of God, <laughs> so I go <laughs> or so I stand. Um, but at our 15th anniversary, it, it gives a little glimpse. It, it has this old name. It's 30 seconds. It goes really fast. <laughs> so you got to pay attention. But I just wanted to just share the favor that God has bestowed in terms of the friends that we have been able to have come along with us, whether it's locally or nationally. And so I'm going to turn on the video. Hopefully it will work. For the past 15 years, KCCD has provided hope, voice, and light to the community through faith and community partnerships. Since 2001, KCCD has garnered many partners from the White House to Fortune 500 companies to bring many firsts to the community. On November 15th, we will celebrate our 15th anniversary and kick off the 25th anniversary of the LA Riots Commemorations Haiku Campaign. Please join us by visiting www.kccd.org. Okay, <laughs> I told you it would go really fast, uh, but <laughs> you know I feel like God's been uh, God has allowed me to conquer all kinds of mountains, right? But this <laughs> technology piece is one that I pray every day. <laughs> but uh, but going back, um, I want to share just in terms of how I came into this space. So I grew up as a pastor's kid and my parents were called to ministry and they thought that they would go and save a lot of souls, preach the gospel. And they actually did a lot of that, um, especially through street evangelism. But in addition to that, um, they really ended up becoming unpaid social workers because just like many immigrant communities and minority communities, the church in essence kind of plays that a place of comfort, place of access. So my parents really ended up becoming unpaid social workers, uh, helping people connect with jobs and housing, uh, driver's license, social security. And in my heart, I always carried this burden of, could there be a better way? And I grew up and I got to know uh, Reverend Mark Whitlock and Pastor Cecil Murray at First Amy Church. And there I saw a model in which they were doing the very same things that my parents were doing, but because they partnered, they created an affiliated nonprofit and they were now able to partner with the broader community, whether they were uh, government entities, um, you know, corporate America, media, other nonprofits. Um, their offering was three million, but now they were able to leverage additional $12 million. So now they could pay their workers, hire the professionals. Uh, but more importantly, I think as a believer and also as a minority, a member of the minority community, I saw something that was very powerful. Two things was that, you know, particularly uh, in the current context of racial tensions and back then in the 92 riots, you know, when I talked about this idea of crying alone and not having others there to cry with you, um, I saw this model of partnership that created a, a place of mutuality. 
right? If you have a partnership, then your success is their success and your failure is their failure. Um, and I saw these stakeholders, whether they were elected officials, corporate America, really lauding the work of the church in places and rooms where usually God's not lifted up. Uh, churches definitely are not named or minority communities are also uh, regarded. And so as this happened, the church's reputation grew and in essence, their influence and welcome grew as well. And because of that, now when important decisions were being made, they were invited to the decision-making table. And I saw this amazing model where God was honored, people got help, uh, and this minority community, church community, uh, got lauded, welcomed, uh, and had influence in coming to those decision-making tables. I think as Christians, one of the things that I always have this heart and burden is that whenever Christian or God's name in the media is always related to something negative, uh, something that we did terrible, right? Uh, that was contrary to our model of what we believe a Christian uh, is supposed to be. And so I saw this model that really countered that um, by them shining their light, that uh, even on the 10th anniversary, President Bush bypassed the Korean community, right? But he went to First Day Me, led by a pastor who's hardcore Democrat, right? Bush is hardcore Republican. But because of their light in the community, uh, it attracted all kinds of partners. And so I thought, gosh, you know, I love to bring this to my community. And it was a passing thought, but lots of miracles happened. And in 2001, our organization came to be. And um, we've had since then over 700 partners uh, from White House to Fortune 500. Maybe in that 30 second blip, you saw some photos going by. Um, but the point is that I think particularly when we started the organization, being Korean was not sexy. Definitely churches were not sexy. So either one, I had this weight, right? And again, through God's favor, I enter uh, into rooms where usually I'm the only one as, you know, female, younger looking, <laughs> as well as Korean church, et cetera. And, you know, I would, sh I would flash my business card and, you know, because they're curious because I kind of stand out. And as soon as they see the title Korean churches for community de development, like you could see the glaze on their eyes, like next, right? Let me go on to someone more powerful, et cetera. And so I've learned how to kind of get myself back into the door, into the room, right? And I'll just give an example. Um, when we did our first home ownership fair, um, at the time, um, I saw that there was a, a great program, a City of LA Down Payment Assistance Program, where they gave $120,000, right, to help people buy homes. It's like, wow, it's like free money coming down from heaven. And I thought, you know, when I would visit fairs and there would be no Asians, no Koreans. And I'm thinking, you know what? I know that people around me, they'll be interested in this information, but I bet you these decision makers, because of the model minority myth that Asians are doing so well, they probably just concluded they don't need any help. You know, it's so no investments needed in that community. But in my heart, I knew otherwise. And so long story short, we went to a fair, we saw who were the speakers, sponsors, you know, everything, right? And brought it to our community. And we tried to convince the sponsors to come to our fair. And long story short, they tried to kind of like give all kinds of excuses. One just flat out denied that they did it, even though we got their business card and called, called them the prior month, right? But anyway, long story short, we somehow got them in the room at that first fair. 600 people came out and 125 of the people did a credit score check. 95%, this is a bank telling us, the 95% of the 125 had credit scores 750 plus. Wow, right? And we repeated something at a very similar level at our second fair. And, you know, the entity that said they don't do home ownership fair, well, after that, they came to us, right? And said, um, you know, for your, no, here's $45,000. We want you to hire someone so you could do this kind of event all year long and provide certificates that will help people uh, in Korean language, right? to become homeowners uh, by connecting with down payment program. And so I think for me and for all immigrant communities uh, and for those of us who serve um, as a voice for the voiceless, I think that it's very important that we embrace the God-given light that each one of us have. 
and you could be again homeless you could be disabled you could be whatever the society may say you're an outcast but they have their god-given light and it's interesting because when we first started and this is before the home ownership fair um you know we were trying to meet again with stakeholders elected officials etc and you know we didn't have a lot of money we had nothing and um but we took a survey that was published by a Korean newspaper, the 16 mega churches, and their congregation size was from 1,000 to 4,000. And these are warm bodies on Sunday morning. Their offering was a million to 6.9 million, right? And um, what happened was, um, again, our community, we had the highest or the second highest language barrier, which is a liability, right? In most situations, you know, if you can't speak the language, it comes with all kinds of, you know, consequences or liability. You can't get a job, you're going to blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, it's kind of interesting because we went to an elected official uh, and a HUD representative and their whole body language is, you know, they're folding their hands, kind of looking back, you know, like, you know, how can I help you? Like, you know, that look of disdain, perhaps patronization, whatever you want to call it. Um, but, you know, when I showed that survey of the money <laughs> that our community had in churches, we maybe as individuals in our community, especially Korean community at the time, we were one of four whose median income was below the national median with the Latino community, the black community, and Native American. So we were down and under, but you know, no one knows that, right? But anyway, um, so when we showed that in our community, in the Korean community, our strength and our asset was actually in our churches because of our language barrier, all these people went to church and the ethnic media to rely on all you know access right and so basically we said you know if you want to reach our community here's a very for a very small amount of money you could have huge returns right versus like publicizing something in the la times right and it turned like i said their attitude was like from how can i help you right to like how can i help you <laughs> and so and we've had so many of these stories and i think again going back about you know, migrant communities, immigrant communities, you know, we are looked upon in many ways as having liabilities and that's what we focus on. And I think if you think about the five loaves and two fish, the disciples became very overwhelmed when they saw all those people and what they didn't have. But as soon as they shifted into identifying what they did have, the five loaves and two fish, brought it to the Lord. And once it was blessed, and as they started to break and share, the uh, five loaves and two fish turn from scarcity into abundance. And so that has been kind of the model in which that we have worked. How do we find that light? How do we find the assets that are in our communities or the people that we serve? Last but not least, I want to conclude by saying that, you know, doing this for like 15, 16 years, you know, and having many of these successes that I could kind of praise God about with churches, you know, like you think that after all that, like, you know, when a new opportunity, new initiative comes that you could call upon a pastor, send an email and they will be like, hey, Finn, you know, what do we do next? Right. <laughs> but instead, it would always it felt like I was starting from first base and I really sought God to say, God, what am I doing wrong here? Have I like missed it, or maybe I'm doing this for myself and not for you or for the people. But what I realized was that I thought about my dad who was a first generation immigrant pastor, a one man show, maybe part-time secretary with volunteer you know, folks. And could he take what I had and digest it and navigate to, the, navigate to the finish line? And if I was honest, I realized what the stakeholders required and where pastors were, that gap was too huge. And so instead of being frustrated or angry, resentful, I realized that we need to lay down some stepping stones. And so that's how we started this program called the C2 Leadership Institute, Church and Community Leadership Institute. We literally download um, like the things that people need, media relations, government relations, fundraising, but more importantly, this mindset of partnership, right? Uh, we're leveraging all those other stakeholders and not doing it alone. God doesn't even do it alone, right? And so we literally download the skills, the tools, 
the relationships and the mindset. So like media relations, we brought the LA Times reporter before they ever come, we give them a media release template. They download their information for the project. We teach them how to do their one minute pitch. We help them develop their collateral. So in that meeting it's a two way training and not a one way conversation. And I just wanna conclude that uh, one individual that was in our program, he was a lifer. This was for pastors, but others came in. He was a lifer. He got detained by ICE when he first came out. And his project, we called it the Second Chances Initiative. He was trying to get a governor's pardon. Long story short, we put him in front of lots of people and he got his pardon. And his testimony is that before this institute, he felt that his past was a source of shame. But going through this institute, he realized it was a platform for empowering others. And now I see him in rooms that he would never have been invited. But even if invited, he would never have shown up. And even if he had shown up, he would never have spoken up. But he's doing all that. So I praise God for this next decade. <laughs> so it'll be our third decade in existence. I pray that, uh, that God will, well, he, I know God will always keep me humble, <laughs> for sure, <laughs> with so many things out of my hand and control. But I pray that there will be a lot more partners that will come along to really, again, be a <clears throat> advocate voice for the immigrant and migrant communities, for the voices of faceless uh, people as well, and that God can be honored uh, in partnership with lots of stakeholders who will not normally be friends of the faith community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hippin. That was amazing. Kelvin Sauls, jump on in. Good afternoon, everybody. We would want to express appreciation to Alexa for this opportunity to share uh, this afternoon. I also want to acknowledge my fellow panelists, uh, Reverend De Leon, uh, as well as my dear sister uh, and uh, partner uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, Hypen Im. Always good to see you uh, and appreciate uh, your leadership. Uh, and your partnership in the work that we uh, do to facilitate collective impact uh, here in uh, the city and the county of Los Angeles. And I know you, of course, Hyper now are doing work beyond, you know, uh, Los, uh, Los Angeles. So that's, that's great uh, to hear. Uh, I was born and raised in South Africa, so I'm a black immigrant uh, from uh, South Africa. And uh, I would wanna just share with you for a few minutes uh, uh, around, you know, um, uh, my work um, with immigrants, uh, you know, using a national uh, perspective that uh, I've been involved in, and then bring it down, you know, uh, to uh, Los Angeles. Let me start off by sharing with you that in my uh, 20 uh, plus years uh, as an ordained pastor uh, in the United Methodist Church, uh, I have uh, come to uh, conclude, uh, even though it'll always be adjusted, uh, that my theology of missiology, uh, some might call it my theory of change, but my theology of missiology uh, is this. Uh, when uh, some uh, mobilize to otherize, um, we as people of faith uh, must organize to humanize. Um, and I think that's very, very important for me because um, in the United States, the strategy of marginalization uh, uh, continues to be a strategy of dehumanization. Uh, and I think one needs to uh, just uh, really come to terms with that. Uh, and so uh, this whole piece about uh, being able to affirm one's humanity uh, in so many ways invites us uh, to see how we can then um, activate one's divinity uh, around that. Uh, for you see, to, de de to dehumanize uh, is to look for ways to minimize um, the divinity that reside in each one of us. Uh, and so uh, I have four pillars that have, I've now realized, you know, uh, has guided me in this particular word work. The first one is intention, uh, intersectionality, um, which is very, very important for me because I'm black and an immigrant. Uh, and so uh, that uh, in essence uh, places me uh, at the intersection here in the United States uh, of both 
uh, historical challenges that uh, Blacks have faced, uh, but then also the ongoing challenges then uh, that immigrants uh, continue to face. Uh, so this whole piece about intersectionality is uh, essential for me. The next pillar for me is uh, mutuality. Uh, it invites us into uh, our getting to know and understand uh, our own you know, our concern, but then to try and see how we can broaden our concerns uh, to include the concerns of others. Uh, as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, and so this whole sense of mutuality uh, that uh, brings together for me uh, what Dr. King writes about in that letter from Birmingham jail and what we as South Africans talk about uh, in terms of Ubuntu uh, is uh, very instructive for me around this whole piece uh, of mutuality. The third pillar uh, for me is one of unity. You might ask, why didn't I put unity first? Uh, well, it's quite difficult to unite folk that do not uh, see, no experience intersectionality, uh, nor uh, a sense of mutuality. Uh, and so <clears throat> unity, you know, uh, for me is that third pillar uh, because uh, I've seen now uh, in the work that I've done with uh, immigrants and migrants, uh, that uh, we've got to deal with those two pillars first before we bring in the one of unity. I've seen in my work here in Los Angeles that uh, we would stop at unity. Uh, I dare say uh, that is uh, where I believe, you know, we have fallen short uh, to bring complete healing uh, to what happened after the Watts riots as well as the 92 riots. Uh, is uh, there was an overemphasis in unity, but not enough emphasis on this fourth pillar that I think is essential for us if we are to move towards beloved community, uh, which is the pillar of solidarity. Uh, uh, I find that my experience of the divine of God is kind of connected with all of these, mm -hmm. you know, uh, three, you know, uh, as we do the work that we seek to do. So having said that, um, you know, when I arrived in the Bay Area in 1996, I was there for 10 years until um, 2006. Um, uh, from there, you know, uh, here in um, uh, Los Angeles, after doing a stint of national and international work for the denomination, um, uh, it was very, very uh, interesting around the experience of migration, of displacement, uh, that I have now experienced in all of my uh, uh, appointments in the United Methodist Church. You know, uh, in San Francisco, we were dealing with what happened with, uh, with, with Japanese Americans via the internment camps, you know, uh, that took place there. So it was African American having to deal with that whole migratory experience, you know, uh, that uh, took place in the, 19, in the late 1940s uh, with our Japanese sisters and brothers. Uh, and then uh, in Oakland, in North Oakland, right next to South Berkeley, right next to Emeryville, uh, a whole, you know, uh, again, you know, gentrification displacement that was taking place uh, with that African-American community, you know, over there. Uh, and then uh, uh, being here in Los Angeles now, you know, uh, dealing with a similar challenge around, you know, the whole piece of migration. Uh, and so while I was in the Bay Area, uh, it was during the time where there was uh, huge, of course, marches because of what was happening, you know, around immigration around uh, the country. Uh, and so here I was as a uh, black immigrant uh, pastoring uh, very, very intentionally uh, African-American, you know, a congregation in an African-American community uh, because of these four pillars that I've embraced, you know, uh, around that. Uh, and I, I noticed two things. The first thing I noticed uh, was the uh, uh, the silence of African Americans around what was happening, you know, uh, with you know uh, immigrants. The second thing, uh, the absence uh, of Black immigrants as part of all of these marches, that led me to a conversation with Reverend Phil Lawson, uh, and uh, he helped me understand, you know, uh, really. Uh, this whole piece because there was a tension uh, between the immigrant rights uh, organizations declaring uh, that they are here to replace, 
the civil rights movement, kind of like it's our time now. Um, and uh, he helped me understand that by saying that, you know, uh, we never named our movement the civil rights movement. That was part of mainstream media seeking to minimize uh, our vision and the work that we sought to do in that movement. We've always looked at our movement as a human rights movement. Um, so following a conversation with him, we pulled together several black immigrants and African-Americans. And out of that birth, uh, uh, Black Alliance for Just Immigration uh, that sought to uh, be a bridge by bringing firstly um, uh, um, a critical analysis to the racial you know, uh, challenges that was going on in the immigrant rights movement. And secondly, uh, uh, an economic framework you know, uh, uh, for what was happening during, during that time. And so through the Black Alliance for Just Immigration out of Oakland, uh, we, are, uh, we were able to launch, you know, just a movement, you know, a, again, using those pillars of intersectionality and mutuality to see how we can frame, you know, what needs to happen with, for and with Black immigrants, especially given uh, the challenge of anti-Blackness within the Hispanic community, which is real. Uh, and so, you know, it just enabled us to build these bridges, you know, with that community and uh, dealing with uh, xenophobia, you know, uh, in the African-American community. Uh, hence, this intentional bridging that had to take place, uh, and I dare say must take place on an ongoing basis uh, if we are to uh, do the missiology work that God is inviting us to do, you know, for such a time uh, as this. Uh, during that time, uh, at Downs, we were able to establish a CDC, and through that CDC, we were then uh, able to engage in community development, as well as building 17 units of senior housing, you know, uh, in that community uh, uh, by way of partnerships with philanthropic organizations, uh, as well as with the state. So that was just uh, awesome for us. Uh, uh, within the denomination, I then moved on, I was invited to serve on a national uh, ministry called Justice for Our Neighbors uh, that uh, sought to be able to, you know, um, to be able to move uh, from uh, just a ministry, you know, uh, of charity to a ministry of justice as it relates, you know, uh, to uh, immigrants, which was very, very powerful because now we were able to get the stories and hear the stories, you know, uh, of immigrants as we were now seeking to serve them you know, around their, uh, their, their services vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, the, um, uh, um, uh, the legal needs, you know, that they, that they had. So that was just incredibly powerful for me, you know, uh, to be able to just be a part, you know, uh, of, uh, of that. Uh, I landed then uh, in Southern California uh, after uh, doing, you know, some national and international work uh, as the, Director, executive director for new ministry for the California Pacific Annual Conference, uh, congregational development, and in that uh, was uh, had the privilege of overseeing our ministry with all of our racial ethnic, you know, uh, uh, groups: Hispanic, Pacific Islanders, Asian American, you know, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that was just a joy to be able to see how we can do congregational vitalization for community transformation uh, and not look at immigrants uh, as, you know, uh, uh, pawns to save dying and fledgling white congregations, but to really see how we can have a theology of missiology and evangelization, you know, with our immigrant communities that look at them as assets, uh, that look at them as value added, and that look at our immigrant sisters and brothers, you know, uh, as ones who can make uh, a transformative contributions, you know, to the work that we have to do. I'll never forget when I was in a workshop once doing that and somebody, you know, a, a, a white member asked me, you know, uh, you know, we've tried this and we've tried that, you know, to try and just see how we can get them to be Methodist and it's so important that, you know, they used to be, they just used to being Catholic, but we need to get them to be Methodist. And I stopped them in its tracks. And I said, that's exactly your problem, you see. 
uh, uh, we are called to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We are not called to make Methodists. That is a very, very short-sighted, institutionalized, you know, strategy in the work that we've been called to do. But instead, if we offer people Christ, I think that's what John Wesley kind of was all about. You know, uh, last I checked, you know, uh, we'll be amazed uh, how it uh, invites us uh, to engage our sisters and brothers just in powerful, you know, and ways like that. Ed Holman uh, uh, was a, uh, a Pan-African congregation, African-Americans, and we had, you know, uh, uh, black immigrants from five, you know, uh, African countries, uh, uh, three Caribbean countries, and two South American countries, Belize and Panama. Uh, and so we were, you know, so as I arrived there, you know, uh, really, you know, uh, uh, sought to see how we can allow, you know, uh, uh, the blessing of our diversity uh, to facilitate for us a port of entry to serve you know, uh, that changing community, you know, given the migratory experiences that we all, you know, uh, 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 had, not just for coming from Africa, the Caribbean, South America, but also African-Americans who have migrated, right, from the South and from the Midwest and from the, you know, uh, Northeast and to find some sense of intersectionality, you know, uh, around there to do the work that, uh, that we've been called, you know, uh, to do. And so uh, that was just uh, great because Holman uh, had a history of working with migrants because in the 80s, Holman was one of the sanctuary, you know, uh, uh, spaces for migrants from El Salvador. Uh, and so it was, it was great to remind the congregation, <laughs> you know, uh, of the work that we used to do and to try and see now how can we update and upgrade it in new and, uh, and renewed ways to be able you know, uh, to do that. Let me conclude by saying uh, that this work now uh, continues for me, you know, uh, as I now work in the community, you know, uh, with you know, uh, organizations such as Chirla, you know, uh, where we seek to continue to do the work you know, uh, with you know, uh, our uh, uh, immigrant sisters and brothers. Uh, the work uh, of, you know, uh, an organization called the International Society of Black Latinos uh, uh, that uh, continues to see how they can serve the needs of uh, uh, black Latinos, you know, in the midst of what's still going on around some of the issues, you know, uh, some of the racial challenges. At Community Coalition, where I am, I mean, at the heart of their work, when Karen Bass founded it, was unity and solidarity because she founded that organization as a black and brown organization uh, and, and that vision continues in so many different ways and then uh, at the community health councils you know where i serve you know and coordinate a program called a healthy kids zone uh, which is a place based participatory research program about 80% of our participants you know, uh, 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 immigrants, and probably about 40% uh, of them undocumented. And it is just powerful to see uh, as we seek to address, you know, uh, 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 houselessness, uh, the challenges with education, uh, as we seek to address uh, issues of police brutality, uh, detention, and all of that, to see how through it, we can continue to organize and mobilize, you know, uh, our immigrants uh, to realize how they can build people power in such a way that they can facilitate liberatory progress in the work that we've been called uh, uh, to do. So grateful to be a part of this ongoing movement uh, that we see has been renewed not too long ago uh, in terms of the, mu the movement to otherize, which once again invites us to reset and reposition ourselves to mobilize our faith so that we can humanize uh, uh, sisters and brothers, no matter where they're coming from, uh, uh, knowing that uh, we all are created in the image of God and can be valuable assets uh, in the beloved community that we've been called to build. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Salas. That was really amazing. So we do have a couple questions. Um, one in particular that I think is just a very real question. 
as all of you have told wonderful stories of leadership development. There's a question that says, there are community leaders who use their agencies in promoting their ambition and eventually hurt representing communities. What are the practical suggestions from all of your experience to prevent this leadership problem? So true. What yeah. do you have to share? It looks like Reverend Sauls that you wanna start us. Yeah, I, you know, I'll jump in on that. I mean, you know, let me just say that happens in all communities. You know, uh, uh, I mean, we only have to look uh, no further than 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So this is something that happens with all, you know, uh, our communities. I, I think, you know, uh, what we need to invite people to do is to see how we can continue to build the agency of leaders and the capacity of organizations around three very important principles. The first one is integrity to the mission and the vision of the organization, you know, uh, and not a particular individual. And so the, the, the creation and articulation, you know, of that mission and vision is clear. You know, when I was at, at, at all of my congregations and we would work on a mission and a vision statement, I would say to them, this vision and mission statement even invites me into integrity. So I am not above the mission and the vision statement, you know, uh, because I would say to folk, if you come with an, an idea to me, the very first question I'm going to ask you is, how will this advance? How will this advance the mission and the vision of the church, not the mission and the vision of Calvin Sauls? The second piece, in addition to integrity, is transparency. How do we continue to uh, invite leaders to be as transparent as we can be? Uh, uh, I have a saying, nobody gets a pass, you know, uh, around that, you know, uh, whether I'm the same ethnicity of a person, uh, speak the same language of a person, we must hold all leaders uh, uh, accountable. So accountable, I mean, uh, uh, to a sense of transparency in terms of what uh, needs to be done and how we do what we need to do. And then the final one is accountability. You know, uh, how do we invite people into giving account, you know, uh, giving an account is an integral part of our faith traditions, our faith formation, our discipleship in terms of, you know, uh, giving account. So I always lift up, you know, uh, those three pieces, you know, uh, integrity, transparency, and accountability, you know, uh, uh, that we need to hold people accountable to, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, if need be, uh, to just, you know, uh, gently facilitate you know, uh, the exit of some folk, uh, if, it see, if it seems as if, you know, uh, their presence, you know, uh, uh, is to the detriment of the organization. So, um, hey, Pin or Lee, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I think um, if we knew the answer, then uh, there would be no problem, right? <laughs> but I do want to say, and but I totally do agree with what Calvin has said right now. So I do want to, you know, uh, reinforce that. Uh, I think for me, as mentioned earlier, it seems that if and when it, I ever do, like in terms of power, um, gets to my head, it seems because so many things are not in my control that um, it gets me on my knee real fast, you know, so it uh, keeps me humble per se. But I think, you know, whenever, I think the word integrity, I think is very important. Whenever the, uh, the, cart comes before the horse, you know, where people's self-interest precedes the effort or the mission of whatever effort or movement that you are part of, I think that's when it starts getting funky. Um, and I'm being nice about that. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> and so I think in that way, that accountability, a process for accountability, I think is really important with transparency as well. So Lee, did you have anything to add? And then, and then we're actually out of time, so we're not going to get to these oh. other great questions. But, but Lee, if you can share, and then we'll close. Well, I, I think one of the things I do with with uh, a lot of our partners, and you know, uh, you know, the other day, you know, we were talking about a building capacity within our community and and helping others along in their work. Um, but I think that one of the things that that we've done is um, is just remind ourselves that. Um, values drive everything we do. And, and I think that just 
that's something that I, in fact, I'm preparing for, you know, uh, for a kind of a leadership gathering of, of those that work in our organization. And I always remind them that the values have to drive our vision, they have to drive our mission. And those values have to be, in our case, grounded in God's word. So, um, you know, to me, that's key and that's important. Wow, well, this has been such a, a rich time. You know, you all have so much to offer. And I know that our people are inspired by what you've said. Mm-hmm. I know it. I can feel it <laughs> through all of the airwaves. <laughs> and I want to say uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart to all three of you. 